eight weeks. It's eight, it's eight weeks we've been doing this. So, so ready. I am so, so ready as well. Be more ready. Uh huh. What do you think of the hair? What do you think of the hair tonight? It's fine. It's good. I got a nice sweep. I got a nice little sweep going here. Yeah. Oh, hi. And welcome to A Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. You know, the great state of Michigan is grappling with a series of disasters right now. Record unemployment, coronavirus, flooding, and today, a visit from Donald Trump. There's a reason it's wearing a mitten, because it doesn't want you to see which finger it's holding up. Trump went to a Ford plant in Ypsilanti today, and one of the big questions was whether he was going to set a good example and abide by the company's rules by wearing a face mask. People were so concerned that prior to the visit, the Michigan Attorney General wrote a letter asking Trump to wear a mask for the visit, explaining anyone who has potentially been recently exposed, including the President of the United States, has not only a legal responsibility, but also a social and moral responsibility to take reasonable precautions. Okay, you lost him at legal and social and moral and responsibility and wrote a letter. Next time, try delivering your message via sock puppet with a nice set of cans. So would he or would... Of course he wouldn't. Oh, my God. What's it going to take? Just fill it with Skittles and strap it on his face like a feed bag. Can I get a new mask? This one only has purples left. Trump was asked about his decision to go without a mask. Could you just take us through your thought process of why you decided not to wear Well, I did wear. I had one on before. I wore one in this back area, but I didn't want to give the press the pleasure of seeing it. He's right. There would be enormous pleasure in seeing less of his face. Now, any president can be an idiot, but here's where Donald Trump just takes it to the next level. He was answering questions about not wearing masks in front of a sign about how that factory was making masks. Uh-oh, I can't be at a factory where they make masks. Is there a factory where they make a fool of themselves? But Trump proved he had a mask. He just didn't want to wear it. By the way, uh, Mr. Here, Ford, here's, my, here's my mask right here. <laughs> and I liked it very much. By the way, honey, here's the condom right here. I like it very much, just not on the penis. Then Trump was asked about the very real possibility of a second wave of the virus. Are you concerned about a potential second wave of this virus? Well, people say that's a very distinct possibility. It's standard. And we're going to put out the fires. We're not going to close the country. We're going to put out the fires. Look, everybody, just because the building is burning down doesn't mean we're going to close it. We're going to put out the fires as they continue to flare up. Very standard. Now get back to work. And can someone please crank up the AC? It is hot as hell in here. Then Trump's speech began, and he shared some fond Michigan memories. Years ago, I was honored, long before I ever thought of the presidential situation, I was honored in Michigan. It was probably 10 years ago. The man of the year, they named me man of the year in Michigan. Now, this is something Trump has been saying a lot, and it never happened. According to former Congressman Dave Trott, the man who presented Trump with the thing he remembers so well, there was no Michigan Man of the Year award. What he gave Trump was a framed copy of President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. I want to thank President Lincoln for naming me Michigan's Man of the Year. This reminds me of the time the DMV gave me a beautiful plastic card naming me people's sexiest man alive. I keep it in my wallet with the Applebee's coupon naming me the Pope of Chicken Wings. Before the maskless plant tour, Trump held a maskless meeting with some black leaders and told some anecdotes. We've got to open our churches. People want to go in. I saw a scene today where people are trying to break into a church to go into the church, not to break in and steal something, to break in. They want to be in their church. Not to steal anything. Can you believe it? I mean, every time I've gone to church, I usually walk out of there with some 20s from the collection plate and a couple of nice wooden plus signs. Trump also talked about the importance of reopening places of worship. I think churches, churches to me, uh, they're so important in terms of the psyche of our country. Uh, beyond, I mean, to me, they use the word essential. I think churches are essential. Churches are amazing. I visit one every single time I get married. And before he even left for Michigan, the president hovered in place for a mask-free episode of... 
Chopper Talk. At the Chop Talk, Trump talked about his COVID test results in the most confusing way possible. I'm still here, and I tested very positively in a in another sense. So this morning, yeah, I tested positively toward negative, right? So no, I tested uh, perfectly this morning. Meaning, meaning I tested negative. But that's the way of saying it. Positively toward the negative. When it comes to being negative, my test was extremely positive because not to be negative, but being positive would be super negative, and I wouldn't want to not be unnegative. Of that, I'm positive in a negative way. Oh, there's a NASA launch next week, and Trump is considering attending. I'm thinking about going. Uh, that'll be next week to the rocket launch. I hope you're all going to join me. I'd like to put you on the rocket and get rid of you for a while. Houston, we have a douchebag. Hey, there's a new Columbia University study that says if the United States had begun imposing social distancing measures just one week earlier, about 36,000 fewer people would have died. And if we'd done it on March 1st, two weeks earlier, a vast majority of the nation's deaths, about 83%, would have been avoided. Huh. March 1st. What was he saying back around then? Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus, you know that, right? <laughs> coronavirus. They're politicizing it. This is their new hoax. Wow, the Democrats got the entire world in on their hoax. You got us, Dems. <laughs> you can come out and tell us you punked us. Guys? Ollie Ollie Oxygen Tent. There's actually some good news on the pandemic. Yesterday, the CDC announced that the coronavirus does not spread easily by touching surfaces or objects. Woohoo! We can touch surfaces again! Oh, oh, baby. I'm sorry I sprayed you down when I brought you back from the Kroger. Everyone told me you were dangerous, and I believed them. I'll make it up to you, baby. Later, we'll spoon. But don't put away the Lysol just yet, folks. Getting coronavirus from contaminated surfaces still may be possible. It just does not spread easily in that manner. And this is what passes for good news now. We're probably not going to get a deadly virus from touching doorknobs. Which brings me to our new segment, I'll Take It. And that's it for the good news, because experts are now warning of a second wave of cases in the South. When they said the South will rise again, I didn't know they meant body temperatures. This warning comes by way of a new study where researchers use cell phone data to track social mobility. What? They're using my cell phone to track me? Siri, set a reminder not to trust you. Done. Some areas are predicted to see it worse than others. For example, researchers say that South Florida looks worrisome. A sentence that really could have been written at any time. Explaining why South Florida looks so particularly bad. One researcher said of the region, it's a densely crowded area. There's a lot of Tinder down there. And if you're trying to avoid spreading disease, the last thing you want is Tinder. Consent is important! We also got a troubling study from Trump's alma mater, the Wharton School of Business, which found that eliminating all social distancing guidelines could cause positive coronavirus case numbers to take as high as 5.4 million by July 24th. Those are the most troubling numbers Wharton could release, other than Trump's grades. More not the best fantastic news, because according to a new report, coronavirus testing is a mess in the U.S. because proper testing regimes require federal guidance, leadership, and support. Really. That's like reading a recipe and seeing the main ingredient is the one you don't have. Okay, I got eggs, I got flour, damn it. Hey, honey, did we order any leadership? Crap. Well, I guess I'll just bake it differently in every state. All this negative news on testing is hard to take, but it was even harder to deliver because it came from the University of Minnesota. Minnesotans are so nice. 
It must be torture for them to give bad news. I mean, just look at this from the university spokeswoman. Okay, hi. How's everybody doing today? It is so nice out. Finally, might even put the tarp on the snowmobile. Oh, I made you a tater tot hot dish. And there will be plenty to share because unfortunately, most of you folks are gonna die because our testing has gone straight to H-A double hockey sticks. Anyway, I'm gonna need that Pyrex back. So just put it in your will. Bye. We've got a great show for you tonight. I'll be talking to Vice President Joseph R. Biden. Stick around. Mm -hmm.